Hello. This is the third part of my lecture summary on the work of Sir Francis Galton. In this video I will cover three topics. Galton's contributions to modern statistics, his social philosophy of eugenics, and his overall academic impact. First, statistics. A key element in Galton's thought was the importance of measurement and as such he became one of the major figures in the development of modern statistics. He followed the principle that whenever you can, count. There are many trivial examples of what we might call an obsession with counting. Thus, during his exploration of Southwest Africa in the 1850s, he measured the figures of native women from a respectful distance and found them impressive by comparison with English women. Later, back in Britain, he counted the number of pretty, average and ugly girls he passed on the street, finding the incidence of pretty girls highest in London and lowest in Aberdeen. Again, at scientific meetings, he counted the number of fidgets per minute in a sample of 50 audience members, reckoning that fidgeting decreased by over half when the speaker was interesting. Statistics came to have a far more serious role when Galton began his extended study of inherited mental differences, which I've discussed in the previous video. His approach here, as with all other problems that interested him, was to find something to count so that he could calculate proportions, compare averages, and then draw conclusions. An important influence on Galton's early statistical ideas was the work of the Belgian astronomer Adolf Ketelet, who in the 1830s had popularized the value of studying averages as a means of understanding the natural and social worlds, and shown that variations of variables such as the height and chest sizes of specific human populations followed the normal distribution of a Gaussian function or bell curve. Thus, for example, a few French conscripts were very tall and a few very short, but most were fairly close to the average. Galton applied and extended this approach to what he regarded as mental ability in his 1869 book, Hereditary Genius. In this, he established the mathematical law of deviation from an average, what we now term the standard deviation, as a means of quantifying the expected incidence of a variable at increasingly greater degrees of difference from a population average. In the case of his study, he found that the men he identified as eminent were a small and often interrelated group, and that the incidence of these men was in accord with statistical theory if it was assumed that mental ability followed a normal distribution, that is, that the truly illustrious would be a tiny minority at the high end of the curve. His work on normal distribution also led Galton to invent the bean machine, or Galton box, in which a vertical flow of beans will naturally form a bell curve shape. Galton later established an anthropometric laboratory in which he tested almost 10,000 people for their physical characteristics and mental responsiveness. As he had suspected, these all followed a bell-shaped distribution curve but he sensed that he would get additional information if he could find some way of measuring whether or not different variables were related to each other and, if they were, to what degree. This led him to an early form of regression analysis as a means of establishing the extent of the correlation between two variables. The method he hit upon was essentially visual rather than analytical, but still of enormous value. First, he drew a scatterplot diagram recording each individual datum on an ordinary x and y graph where x and y represented the two variables to be examined. He then joined similar scores with lines similar to the isobars he had previously invented as a means of identifying weather patterns and then sought visually to fit what we now call a regression line which best described the relationship between the variables. Galton then went further, seeing that in one of the relationships he was studying, that between the heights of adult children and their parents, there was what we would now call regression towards the mean. That is, although tall parents normally had tall children and short parents short children, the children were likely to be less tall or short, that is, closer towards the mean, than their parents. 
Some years later, the British biometrician Carl Pearson, Galton's protégé and later biographer, worked out a way of calculating the coefficient of correlation mathematically without the need for a scatter diagram. This was the regression value, R, with correlations varying between 1, a perfect co-variation, and 0, no variation whatsoever. And this has remained the standard method of correlational analysis to the present day. Galton's discovery of a means of measuring the degree of correlation has become a central concept in all scientific inquiry and is an essential and powerful tool for the natural and social sciences. Thus, a strong correlation between two variables indicates that the relationship between them is likely to be causal one variable being a cause or partial cause of the other, or both being the concurrent effects of some other cause. I will talk more about correlations in another video. Now let's turn to eugenics. Closely tied to Galton's interest in inherited differences was his invention of the social philosophy of eugenics, the term eugenics, well-born, being one which he himself invented. This was essentially the advocacy of applying traditional selective breeding methods to human beings. Such methods have long been used by farmers to produce cows, sheep and other animals with particular qualities desired by the farmers. For example, cows which produced more milk or meat. And what Galton wanted to see was the gradual improvement of the human stock by similar methods. Galton was concerned that most human beings seemed mediocre and that the overall quality of the population would therefore deteriorate if mediocre people had lots of children whilst those who were gifted had few. The result would be a proliferation of children who were inferior in moral, intellectual and physical terms. Therefore, he believed it was necessary for society to adopt a system of ranking people according to their physical and intellectual vigour and then offering positive financial inducements to the most able to marry young and have children. At the same time, the very least able people should be discouraged from having children altogether, living lives of quiet celibacy in institutions set aside for them. These ideas were firstly directed at the British and invoked a positive response from various eminent men and women. And in 1903, Galton established a eugenics laboratory at University College in London to further his ideas. A eugenics education society was established in 1907, which later published its own journal. His ideas also attracted attention overseas, and the first International Congress of Eugenics was held in 1912, but Galton, already in frail health, had died shortly before its opening. Galton also left funds to establish a professorship in eugenics at University College. In later years, eugenics was enthusiastically adopted as an actual practice rather than merely as a social philosophy in both the United States and in Nazi Germany. American and Nazi German eugenics had a number of major differences from the original ideas of Galton and the British eugenicists who continued to uphold them, however. I will discuss these developments in more detail in another video, but the following may be noted. Firstly, Galton's ideas never gained official support in Britain, whilst they did in the United States and Germany. Secondly, in the United States and Germany, state support included the adoption of means to limit the population of those deemed undesirable, that is, negative eugenics, in the United States by immigration controls and in some states by forced sterilization, and in Nazi Germany both by sterilization and the actual extermination of undesirables. Thirdly, in both the United States and Germany, the category of undesirables came to include groups identified in racial terms. In Britain, by contrast, eugenics was predominantly socially elitist rather than racist in nature. 
This social elitism can be seen in Galton's belief that Britain should welcome high-quality immigrants and refugees from other lands and grant their descendants citizenship, and that there were individuals of high quality in all national and racial groups. He did think in racial terms, but they were not those of a modern racist. The ancient Athenians were more gifted than modern English, for example, and amongst modern peoples, the Jews, Italians and Chinese seemed particularly gifted, he thought. Indeed, he opined that the Chinese should be encouraged to colonize Africa because of their energy and love of social order. Finally, turning to Galton's overall impact on the development of psychology, it is ironic that whilst Galton remains one of the most influential influences on psychology of all time, his contributions to psychology are largely forgotten. His name means little to most psychologists and is unknown to the general public. Thus, Galton was chiefly responsible for devising both the research program into inherited individual differences, which has continued to the present day, the concept of mental testing, which has had a massive social impact and continues again to the present day, various related research methodologies, notably twin studies, and the vital research tool of correlational analysis. Galton's role in these contributions is generally not remembered. Instead, his name is readily associated with the eugenics philosophy which he originated and the later American and Nazi eugenics policies which served to severely discredit it. In the context of his day, we can note that at a time when Wundtians and others were looking for universal psychological principles, Galton was looking for differences between individuals, for example, in response times, and for relationships between these and other traits and abilities. At a time when Wundt and James were introducing forms of introspection, Galton was looking for objective ways of testing people's abilities. Again, although Galton was the founder of a new psychology of individual differences, his ideas did not come to be represented in a Galtonian school of psychology. In Britain itself, of course, psychology remained largely unorganized, and Galton was the quintessential amateur working alone outside a university. He did not supervise any doctoral dissertations. Neither he nor any of the small number of British psychologists at the time considered creating a definite school of psychology. Thank you.